Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pokolsky, and today we're going to interview Dr. Ralph Esposito. And everything about this podcast is going to be framed around optimizing muscle building. And that's what the Muscle Expert Podcast is about. I want you guys to realize that everything we do is about allowing you to live your greatest life and your greatest body. And uh, Dr. Esposito gives us an awesome deep dive on the things that we may be doing wrong or the things we may be misunderstanding about testosterone and how to do it most importantly. He gives us some really great action items, which is always the best value in any podcast, in any learning opportunity. He's going to give you things you can actually do right now to start hacking your testosterone, increasing your libido, improving your perhaps weak sex drive, living your greatest life and building your greatest body, and also why building muscle is probably your greatest opportunity to improve your testosterone. Enjoy this episode, and as always, give us a share and a review on iTunes, because I appreciate you guys, and you guys keep this show going. Thank you. And today's podcast is brought to you by ATP Labs. We've just released a brand new product that you guys are going to love. It's called Myo Prime. Uh, and this is just a creatine-based product with some ATP and HMB. And the reason I love this product is it's kind of an add-on to your current pre-workout. So you guys know I'm not a big stimulant person, but I am a big focus person. And creatine really helps add to that focus product that I always take. So you guys know I'm a big fan of the GF, which is the growth factor by ATP, which is primarily just alpha-GPC and tyrosine, driving up some dopamine and acetylcholine in your brain. But if you want to add the pump factor and the cellular energy to that so that you can have the fuel you need to fuel your workouts, then I highly suggest you add Myo Prime. And if you think I'm cool, I think you're cool too. So if you use the code BEN10, B-E-N, and the number 1010, you get 10% off this month only. Enjoy the podcast. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Another episode of the Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski, and today we've got the male doctor from New York, Dr. Ralph Esposito. What's up, man? Hey, guys. How you doing? Dude, I'm super excited to talk to you. I've been following your stuff for quite a while, and in this fitness industry, there's tons of misinformation around testosterone, around uh, everything to do with male hormones, even around libido. You know, everybody attaches to, you know, I've got this big badge of honor, like I'm the man and I never have <laughs> sexual problems. But to be honest, we all know that many men, you know, and you speak about anyone over the age of 24 has at some point dealt with it. And that's a really interesting stat. And yeah. uh, at some point today, I love to dig into that, man. But um, getting into that, there's some things that you mentioned, um, some misconceptions around testosterone. But the first thing I want to start chasing is the discussion around what is the optimal level for testosterone? Like, you know, the blood test says X, you know, your level should be between X and Y. Um, but personally, and I want to hear your experience. Personally, I've experienced a wide range of things. So I've seen guys who have a testosterone number of, five, of 1,500 and have a low sex drive or don't really have that vigor. And then I've seen people who are at 400 who have tremendous vigor, tremendous sex drive. Where's the disparity? Yeah. So this is a question that I get all the time. And um, actually, I was just talking to a colleague about it recently. And what it comes down to is it's not the number. The European Endocrine Society has determined that in order to treat a man for low testosterone, they need to have low testosterone numbers and they need to be symptomatic. So what are the symptoms of low testosterone? Well, fatigue, um, decrease in libido, erectile dysfunction, uh, difficulty or not waking up with erections, um, having decreased muscle mass or not being able to put on muscle mass, increased adiposity, so usually around the belly area is where we see it most. So those are the symptoms or the signs of low testosterone. But in order for a physician to treat somebody, they need to have both of them. However, I don't really abide by those rules because if a guy is telling me, hey, I have normal testosterone levels, but I'm showing symptoms of low testosterone, then perhaps that can be um, fixed with testosterone supplementation. This is where it becomes very tricky is because doctors, any practitioner, nurse practitioners, doctors, they'll chase a number. And, and you know, men are 
data driven. Most men yep. are, I want to see a number. And sometimes I wonder if I have a higher number, do their symptoms get better because a number got better, number got better, or they saw placebo. the number get better, right? Is sure. there a placebo effect there? Sure. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that there's not, but it does happen. So the way that you have to look at it is if the testosterone number, I like to see the range. So depends on what lab you use for total testosterone. They're using a range of like 250, 300, up to like 900 to 1,000. But actually, a recent study came out showing that free testosterone is actually a more accurate marker. Yep. And you also, there's other things that you have to look at as well. So there's sex hormone binding globulin, there's free yep. testosterone, there's total testosterone, there's estradiol, there's uh, DHT, there's um, prolactin. There's tons of things that you have to look at and take the whole picture together. So I like to see testosterone levels. If a man is symptomatic, I like to see testosterone levels above 600 typically, depending on age. Usually men who are younger, they're usually in the higher range, uh, but usually middle-aged men should be above five to 600. Now, when it comes to free testosterone, the free testosterone, people will look at a, at a, at a regular number, and it depends on what lab you use. Um, but I like to see the free testosterone upwards of like eight nanograms. Um, but you have to look at the percent of free testosterone compared to the total testosterone. Uh. So if you have a testosterone level of 1,000, right, and 1% of that is free, then there's a problem. Sure. Because you're not really taking that. That means that you have a lot of testosterone that's not really being available. Then you have to look at the sex hormone binding globulin. And that is usually uh, increased in men who have uh, high in, or, or insulin resistant, who are have adipos, uh, visceral adiposity, so obesity. Yep. Yep. But also can be on. Um, maybe getting some exogenous or environmental estrogens, right? So like uh, BPA and um, a lot of these other things that are in plastic, just basically environmental toxins. And mm -hmm. um, we can go into this in a little bit. We could talk about diet and the effect that diet has on testosterone levels. Absolutely. So long story short, I the free testosterone really has to be compared to the total testosterone. Now, if they have a testosterone level of 500, which I would consider borderline low, or even if their total testosterone is like three or 400, but their free testosterone is higher, let's say it's five to 10% of that, then I'm less concerned, especially if they don't have symptoms. And then you also have to look at the DHT. Now there's a, there's, oh man, I can go on for days about this, but. Let's do it. I'm into it, man. Let's do the deep dive. My audience is honestly, this is a huge thing for us, right? Especially men, 30, 35 plus, it's massive. It is. So. DHT gets a bad reputation. DHT is the conversion of testosterone to its, what people call the more potent testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. And it gets a bad reputation representation because people think that it's bad. Mm -hmm. DHT is a, a claim to be the cause of hair loss, of BPH, of prostate cancer, of um, uh, many other prostate illnesses, right? Or even, even um, the negative effects of testosterone, like the acne and the aggression. But in fact, DHT, when it's too low, can actually be problematic as well. And there's new studies coming out now that the metabolites of DHT, so there's a beta and an alpha metabolite that um, can be detrimental or beneficial. And we find that the beta metabolite of DHT is actually protective. So looking just at DHT doesn't really tell you the whole story. You need to know where it's going. It's funny. I was just editing. Um, I'm co-authoring a chapter on uh, BPH, so enlarged prostate. And uh, the last time it was edited, I think it was like 2013. And we just re-edited it. And um, we found that a lot of the new research is showing that you know these protective metabolites of DHT can actually reduce the enlarged prostate. So it's completely opposite as what we thought maybe five to six years ago. And you can test for these things as well, but it's really a whole picture approach. So I love that you're bringing this up because I know a lot of people in the fitness industry are self-administering or going to a doctor and getting the, you know, the 
single dose of testosterone, you know, like everybody's, yeah. everybody's getting medicated with testosterone. Can you talk about some of the considerations or limitations of just administering testosterone? And is that a good strategy or should people be looking at doing, you know, complementary things to maybe augment the entire HPA axis? Yeah. So in fact, I'm actually not a huge fan of starting off with testosterone as a sole therapy. Um, if you're going to do testosterone replacement therapy, number one, it should be guided by a physician, mostly because you're able to run labs, you're able to be on top of things, you do a proper intake, proper family history. Um, we can talk about the the controversy over prostate cancer and testosterone in a little bit. Yeah. Yep. But testosterone is not my first option. And the reason why is number one, it's because it turns off the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal and gonadal axis. Now, yep. this is the communication between your hypothalamus, your brain, your pituitary gland, and your adrenals and your gonads, but it also impacts your thyroid. Now, I have seen uh, several men who started testosterone, just testosterone. They were uh, early 20s, which are even, even some in their 30s, where you would suspect that this is you know pretty common. A lot of men do do this, especially if they're in the fitness industry. Um, athletes as much as you know they try to um you know in the past that that was definitely a big issue and what they have found was is when you give testosterone their hpa or hpg access is completely thrown off and i've seen when they stop it they go into hypothyroidism their libido drops and they can't recover now that's a harder problem to fix than if somebody's saying, my energy's fine, I just want more testosterone or I'm having the symptoms of low T. I like to start with um, alternative therapies. Number one, uh, you have to look at sleep. There was one study that came out in the early 20, I think 2012, that found that men who are sleep deprived, that's usually less than five hours of sleep, when they got eight hours of sleep, their testosterone increased equivalent to getting testosterone replacement therapy. So right. just sleep. That I mean, as hard as that sounds, I, I should take my own advice, but it's it's me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So yeah. sleeping, number one, can rejuvenate the HPA or HPG access. Then I like to look at DHEA. Um, DHEA is a precursor to testosterone. Now that's yep. mostly made in the uh, adrenal glands. Now, if you don't have enough uh, substrate, you don't have enough raw material to make testosterone, then it's going to, uh, uh, which is DHEA, if you don't have enough of that, it's going to be it's going to be hard to make testosterone. So I look at that as well, and I start with supplementing with that. Then if those things don't work, I do use a lot of herbals because I'm a naturopath, so I have a lot of training in herbal medicine, and I could give you a list of things that I would go through. Um, but, you know, if those things are not helping, then Clomid. Clomiphene, um, yeah. which is actually pretty helpful because it doesn't, from the research that I found, does not impact the HPA axis. So that so can, can you walk me down the mechanism of that? Because I know there's a ton of misconception yeah. around like, should I be using HCG? Should I be using Clomid? Should I be using, uh, you know, what should I be doing PCT or what should I be doing just to kickstart it in general? So I'd love for you to like, what is the actual mechanism of Clomid? Um, and how do you recommend people take it? Yeah, so uh, Clomid is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. We call it a SERM. Um, now we have new research on or new developments of SARMs, selective androgen receptor modulators, which I'm very excited yep. about because they don't have a lot of the uh, adverse effects of testosterone. But the mm -hmm. study of that and the um, uh, the uh, availability is limited. Actually, Joe Kim Noah, who used to be I don't know if he's still yeah. on Knicks. Uh, he played with the Bulls for a while. Yeah. He got caught last year taking SARMs. Um, so Clomid works as a SERM, which means that it... So are, are they are they illegal SARMs? Um, or maybe banned? They're in the banned. NBA? Yeah, they're, they're okay. a banned substance. Yep. I think DHEA is as well. Hmm. Um, so SERM, selective estrogen receptor modulators, what it'll do is it'll bind... So this is not intended to be used in men. It was originally used for fertility in women, and using it in men is considered off-label, but um, it's been around for so long, and it's dirt cheap, maybe like 20, 30 bucks a month for generic. Um, it's pretty effective, and what it does is it binds to receptors in the brain, estrogen receptors in the brain, and it blocks um, uh, hormones from binding to those receptors, 
which then the brain, the hypothalamus, will say, wait, I'm not getting any estrogen, I'm not getting any activity here, I'm going to increase production of LH, which is luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone, then uh, it goes straight down to the lytic cells of your testicles, and that is what uh, starts off the production or the synthesis of testosterone. So right. men who are on testosterone, the negative effect is they actually have some atrophy or shrinkage, as you can say, um, yep. of their testicles. Right? This does not happen with Clomid. Um, in fact, testosterone is uh, inhibits fertility, whereas Clomid would be enhancing fertility. So that's how Clomid works. Now, most of the time, it can work on its own, and it shouldn't be dosed every day, and you don't really have to do a high dose. A lot of the research has been shown that even as low as 20 to 30, even 50 grams, uh, milligrams of Clomid can be effective three times a week. So you don't have to do it every day. Um, I have seen good success when combining that with HCG together. Right. So that was my next question. What's the mechanism there? And uh, like I said, it, it's the wild, wild west when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. Know? Especially in bodybuilding and fitness. It's, it's like, this guy said I got to do it this way. And this guy said I got to do it this way. Yeah. And it's just complete ignorance and, and misguided. You know, the blind leading the blind. It's always, you know, I call the monkeys because it's <laughs> monkey see, monkey do, right? <laughs> right. So uh, I'd love to have it from the horse's mouth, man. Tell me what, what you've experienced. Yeah, that, that scares me a little bit when people are just taking somebody's opinion or recommendation. Now, I certainly know that there are coaches in the industry who do this, they sleep this, they eat, breathe, and sleep this, right? right? And definitely they have input. But none of them are looking at bloods, man. That's the problem. That's, They're all looking at subjective measures, like how do you feel? Right. Which is great, but like I need to see what your blood's doing, man. Because we, you know, if, if we're taking too much of one thing and it's causing something on the back end, it could be shut, shutting something else down, exactly. causing some other negative side effect where they're not concerned about that stuff. Exactly right. And uh, before I talk about HCG, I want to mention, uh, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that even men who have low normal testosterone levels, um, they have uh, a they have no symptoms, or they may actually have you know increased libido because their androgen receptors are working well, and that's something that nobody is really looking at. There is some right. research showing that. Um, so, what makes up your DNA is nucleotides, right? And there's yep. there's um, basically there's four different kinds, but we found that a repeat of C, A, and G. Uh, continuous repeats in the androgen receptor makes the androgen receptors less sensitive. So kind of like mm. insulin resistance, right? Where, you know, people take insulin, like type 2 diabetics, they have to take insulin because their insulin receptors are not working. We actually right. see that in, um, in, in androgen receptors and testosterone receptors. So my concern is if men are taking testosterone, how do I know that that's not going to happen? And how do I know if that their their levels of seven eight hundred and they're still symptomatic? I can give them double the dose, but is that going to make a difference if the receptor is actually not listening? Just to quickly speak to, speak to that is most people look at professional bodybuilders and they go, "Wow, they must be taking so much testosterone or so many hormones." But the reality is that's not the truth, man. As you get to the top, these guys are taking less and less, but they're actually their body responds more and more. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that stuff because a lot of the low level amateurs or even the high level amateurs are taking so much to get there. When you really get to the top of the sport, man, these guys are going off for three, six, eight months and they don't lose a pound of muscle. And you're sitting there like, geez, like, yeah. and you know, you make your assumptions, but as you get to know these guys, man, it's just because they're, they're hyper responders. And right. that's the genetic advantage in, in bodybuilding is like you say, it's just receptor side affinity. Exactly right. It's just like how some people, they respond very well to diet and lose weight very well. Some people do right. well on a low carb keto diet. Some people do well on a plant based diet. It, you really have to look at the individual person and depending on how their receptors are responding. So now, Doc, get, get to the goods, man. How do we hack this thing? Because that's what everybody wants to hear. How do I get away from this? Okay. This bad receptor site. That's the hard part. Is is we have a difficult time testing for it. I mean, you can right. do karyotyping where they can actually just take your DNA and test it. Um, but I've actually never seen that done clinically, only in the research setting. So, so is that what SERMs would do? Start manipulating these androgen receptors? SERMs? Uh, no, specifically SARMs. Uh, if we're trying to man manipulate the androgen receptors, right? Right. So SARMs, yep. SAR selective androgen, S A R M S, mm -hmm. right? Those actually are ways to activate the androgen receptor in ways right. that testosterone may not be able to do, and it'll flood okay. the receptor. 
that's what we think that it, it could be doing. Again, the research is so new on it, it's really hard to identify the exact mechanism. But the good thing is it, does, it doesn't create a negative feedback to the brain. So when you take testosterone, it sends feedback to the brain and says, stop making LH, stop making testosterone, you're already getting it. Whereas SARMs won't do that at all. Um, I've been looking a lot into maybe there's some uh, herbals, like uh, plants that can actually do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't been fruitful in my research, but I have suspicions as to some herbs, which we know help improve testosterone levels or symptoms of testosterone. Um, one of them would be ashwagandha, uh, Latin name is withania. Really good research yep. on that, actually increasing testosterone levels and improving fertility, but we're not sure exactly yep. why. And I suspect that, again, this is my opinion, that the there's something called withanolides in withania and ashwagandha, and they mimic, they look very similar to the cholesterol steroid uh, structure. There you so go. Yep. maybe... I, I don't know, though. I, I really can't say for sure, but um, people feel better on it. Right. So I wanted to get back to your comment on HG, HCG. HCG, the way it works is it, it's a, it mimics LH. So the molecular structure of HCG is very similar to LH or luteinizing hormone, mm -hmm. which then it directly binds to the testicles and stimulates testosterone production um, okay. without any type of negative feedback as well. But I will say that you want to be careful with HCG. Um, a lot of people have gotten excited over HCG for weight loss. Now, those diets were like 700, 500 calorie diets taking HCG. Right. I don't know. I don't know about you, but if I eat 500 calories, I'm going to lose weight no matter what. Right, right? exactly. But um, you have to be careful because HCG, I have seen um, just a few case studies of liver markers going up. So ALT, mm. AST, but also something called alpha fetal protein, which is a marker for um, liver cancer, but also testicular cancer. Now, I'm not mm. saying that it causes that, but when I see that marker go up, I get nervous. So yeah, absolutely. number one is first do no harm. Um, and again, if you're not measuring labs or checking these men regularly, how do you know that it's uh, safe or effective or not? Right. So some of the recommended administrations of ACG, I've heard everything from you need to do very small, frequent administrations daily. I've heard you need to do massive bolus dose weekly. Uh, and I've also heard things like don't ever do it for longer than three weeks because you'll sh be shutting down your body's own natural luteinizing hormone production. Um, any truth to any of those or what's your typical recommendation for people? So the, the best way to see it dosed would be usually three times a week. Um, doing it in a low dose daily, I, I have really, I haven't really seen much benefit to that. Um, but a large bolus weekly may be too stimulatory. Uh, I would say, um, a regular dose three times a week, similar to Clomid. And usually you can do it on the days that you're not taking the Clomid. So if Clomid's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, ACG is Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, you just don't take anything. Um, that's, that's how I would see HCG to be best used in low doses. Now, whether it causes adverse effects after six weeks, um, you know, I don't, I don't know because what is feeding back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary is testosterone, is estrogen, um, is cortisol. Uh, those are the things that are feeding back. DHEA does not, and I don't, I can't say this for sure, but I, I haven't really seen anything physiologically that HCG will feed back to that loop. So I'm not, I'm not uh, sure if that's actually accurate or not. Hey guys, I interrupt this podcast to let you know about a special appearance coming up on April 6th and 7th in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm going to be appearing at FitCon, appearing twice, once on Friday, once on Saturday. I hope to see every one of you there. I'm an open book. You guys can ask absolutely anything you want. I'm going to be doing a couple of very specific talks about the art and science of muscle building and really how to hack your life to live it in your greatest body. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode and I look forward to seeing every one of you in Salt Lake City, April 6th and 7th at the Salt Lake City Palace. Enjoy. So one of the things that I want to transition to really quick, really uh, nicely is you, saw, you talked about um, prostate involvement in testosterone. And first of all, a lot of people don't even realize how the prostate is involved in this process. So first, if you could speak to that and then talk about some of the misconceptions about the correlations between prostate health and testosterone administration. 
Okay. Do we have a few days? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it first started off with this doctor in like the 40s. He um, from Chicago University, Dr. Huggins or Huggins. And what we found, what he found was that when you castrate, uh, I believe it was dogs, that when you castrate them, their prostate cancer went away, right? So that then started saying, well, that means testosterone causes prostate cancer. Maybe, right? Um, but what testosterone can stimulate production or it causes hyperplasia of the prostate. Now, just just for an FYI, for many of your male uh, patients who may not know where the prostate is, it sits right below the bladder and they usually uh, identify it through a rectal exam, right? And that's when, that's why men, when they get a prostate biopsy, they don't like that because you're sticking a needle through into the prostate, which is not very pleasing and fun. Right. Um, so that's how the whole story started where, you know, testosterone, he found that when you castrate uh, animals with uh, tes- uh, removing their testicles, that their prostate cancer didn't really come back and it kind of died, right? And that's still used today. I mean, we're not we're not physically castrating men, thank God, um, but they're chemically castrating men. And uh, yeah. that's used with a lot of drugs. One of them is like Lupron, which is a, uh, it actually turns off the production of LH and FSH, um, GNRH, really, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Now, that has just been accepted. We all throughout med school, people are taught testosterone causes prostate cancer because it binds to the androgen receptors and causes growth of the prostate. Now, there's a few questions that I that I have for most men who tell me this, or most physicians. I say, well, why don't men who are in their 20s or 30s have BPH, right? Why don't they have an enlarged prostate? Why are they not getting diagnosed with cancer much earlier? Because their testosterone levels should be higher. And obviously, you have a lot of benefits, like longevity definitely has an impact on it. But uh, one of the main researchers for this is Dr. Abraham Morgan Teller. Have you heard of him? I have. Yeah, I love all of his work. I've been reading a yep. lot of his papers. And he came up with a theory, um, which actually is pretty solid. And it's called the testosterone saturation model. And what he found was is that testosterone uh, can cause the prostate or can worsen or m- increase PSA and make it appear that the prostate cancer is getting worse in men who are hypogonadal, in men who have low testosterone levels. Mm. And he calls it the testosterone saturation model is because at about 250 nanograms, right? That's that's a testosterone level total, testosterone level of 250. Right. In men who are lower than that, if you give them testosterone, their PSA increases and their prostate um, may get bigger. But for men who have a testosterone level above that, testosterone therapy will not do that. So Interesting. What, any idea why that is? It's because of the saturation model, which is suspected that the t- prostate has only a finite amount of receptors that above that amount, extra testosterone is not going to do anything extra to the prostate. Okay. And we he suspects that in men who are who are hypogonadal for a long period of time, when you give them testosterone, the prostate cancer may get worse because it's like depriving the prostate. The prostate has been deprived of testosterone for so long, right, over years and decades, that when it introduces testosterone, it kind of soaks it up, right? It's like hmm. adding fuel to the to the fire. But mm-hmm. more recent studies have shown that that's actually not the case. And, you know, <clears throat> I read, I read, I get emails every morning about testosterone and prostate cancer. And recently one came out and said, men with low testosterone have lower risk of prostate cancer. So what does that mean? If you read that, you would think, lower my testosterone. Less testosterone. Right. Right. Less testosterone, less prostate cancer. Right. If you read the study, that's accurate. Men who had lower testosterone levels had lower prostate cancer. But when they got prostate cancer, it was more aggressive. Hmm. Or, or maybe they didn't live long enough to get prostate cancer because they died of some other inflammatory disease like heart disease or right. something, right? right? Exactly right. And, right. and I usually tell men, you're not going to die. Well, I don't tell all men this, but most men do not die from prostate cancer. They die with prostate cancer. Right. In that same study, the men who had, who are on, and by the way, these are men who are on testosterone replacement therapy. 
when they were on the test, this is, and this is a lot of study. These are a lot of patients. I think it was over like a thousand. I can send you the study afterwards. Great. Um, I'll link it in the show notes. The, the men who had higher testosterone levels did get prostate cancer at a higher rate, but it was less aggressive. So the average was uh, the majority of them had a Gleason 6, which now most urologists would not even do surgery on a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. But the men who had low testosterone and did not take testosterone replacement therapy had lower rates of prostate cancer, but when they got it, it was much more aggressive, a Gleason 7 or an 8. So my goal is to identify the aggressive prostate cancer, not just identify the prostate cancer. Let's find the prostate cancer that's going to kill you. So the big picture is that people taking testosterone don't necessarily have to be concerned with the likelihood of increased incidence of prostate cancer. If they do not have prostate cancer, then you're right. Yes, Perfect. they don't have to worry about getting, they don't have to worry about taking testosterone that it may eventually cause them to get prostate cancer. Um, in fact, it might be protective. But people over 40 should still be tested anyways, to, to, to be clear. Yeah, you should always be tested. You always check a PSA. You always do, always see a physician, uh, make sure they're um, doing a prostate exam. There's other tests as well that can identify a man's risk of having an aggressive prostate cancer. One of them is called the 4K score. So um, if your listeners are not familiar, most urologists test PSA, which is uh, a antigen that the prostate releases mm -hmm. um, when it's growing rapidly. Um, actually, there is some research showing that other cells like white blood cells and even breast tissue can release PSA. So it's not specific to the prostate, but when it was discovered, we thought it was from the prostate. Right. So just an FYI. Um, but they, they found that this P, the 4K score, which tests four different types of PSAs, actually can tell you your risk of having an aggressive prostate cancer. So any of your listeners who are concerned about that, who have a family history of prostate cancer, should definitely uh, talk to their physician about that and see if they're at risk. Usually you would do it if a PSA, a, like a blank PSA is above a three or a four. I wouldn't just randomly start testing guys if their PSA is low. Great. Thank you so much for covering that because I know that's a concern in the mind of a lot of guys, you know, like, hey, man, what should I be worried about here? Um, and now moving along, there's one conversation that I know thousands and thousands of our listeners are having, um, and myself included, having used testosterone in the past. Um, any recommended strategies or methods of actually reigniting your body's own natural testosterone levels um, after administration? So, you know, for however long we've been administering testosterone, now we're trying to get off uh, and completely eliminate use or at least minimize use. Um, any strategies you recommend for guys in that situation? Yeah, there's several strategies. Now it depends on what route you want to go. The typical and most effective treatment would be Clomid and HCG with Arimidex, which is a estrogen blocker. Mm -hmm. And you may also want to consider like a DHT blocker, which is usually at a low dose of Avodart. Um, so that prevents conversion of testosterone to DHT. My biggest concern with men who are, who are on testosterone or who are on testosterone is just stopping and not doing mm -hmm. anything. So um, cause testosterone makes you feel good, but it also makes you look good and you have more confidence. Now, if you get off of it, you may look the same, but it's a mental, it's a mental game. And they're like, oh man, I don't have testosterone anymore. Am I going to be able to perform in the bedroom? Am I going to be able to lift as much weight? Man, I, I lifted, you know, I squatted 325 today. And last week I squatted 335. That's because I'm off the testosterone. I mean, those are things that men think about and it Absolutely. runs through their head. Yep. So the most um, beneficial, I would say the most effective way of, of getting off is number one, making sure you, are, you see a physician who, I mean, and this is another thing is that men go to the doctor and they think like, man, he's going to call the police on me because he knows I took testosterone. I'm like, no, he's not going to do that. He wants to help you. <laughs> It's right. it's like people who take, who, um, who smoke marijuana. And I have to ask them like, do you do any illicit drugs? They're like, no. And I'm like, well, marijuana counts. <laughs> and right. they're like, yeah, you know, sometimes I'm like, look, I'm not going to call the cops. It's, I just need to know, right? Like right. I'm not, I'm not here to arrest you. I want to help you, <laughs> but it happens all the time. And the same thing with testosterone. So I usually just tell them, look, if you're going to do it, you have to tell me, I need to be aware. 
and whether I'm managing it or somebody else, I need to know. So what ends up happening is that they'll just stop. They won't tell me. They won't get on an estrogen blocker. So they start getting a lot of the uh, gynecomastia, like man boobs, right? A lot of abdominal fat. Their libido will drop like nothing. It's just as if it wasn't there worse than where they were before. Yeah. And their muscle mass decreases. They increase their risk of prostate cancer because um, we find that estrogen is more of a cause. High estrogen levels are more of a cause of prostate cancer than actual testosterone. So that's a factor as well. So the Clomid with the HCG and maybe um, and definitely a Rimidex or an estrogen blocker. Those are those are ways to help when men get off of it. Now there's other ways as well in addition to, to kind of like slowly cycle yourself off. Um, I think supplementation with DHEA would be helpful because if you're going to completely stop the testosterone synthesis by the testicles, at least providing DHEA, which is the precursor, can help men make their own. Now, um, I wouldn't just say stop testosterone and go to DHEA. You definitely have to look at a lot of the lab markers and see how uh, things are fluctuating. Um, you need to get your sleep right because if you're going to work to make sure that your body can produce its own testosterone, you need to be sleeping seven to eight hours. And that's just a straight rule. And that's not like get in bed at 11 o'clock and, you know, browse uh, Instagram until 12 o'clock and then wake up at six o'clock and say, oh yeah, I got seven hours. No, you didn't. Um, and making sure you're tracking your sleep as well. Like there's a lot of sleep trackers like Fitbits and things like that to mm -hmm. see because men could be waking up at, you know, two times a night to, to, to urinate and that's not quality sleep. So you have to make sure your sleep is right. Um, you have to make sure your diet is right as well because there are a lot of foods that can help you with improving your testosterone production and there's foods that can actually be detrimental. Um, we can go to that uh, at, at nauseum if you will, if you like. Right. Um, so diet and a sleep are really important. Most men who are taking testosterone usually don't have an issue with exercising, but they'll notice that when they stop testosterone, they can't train five, six times a week and recover and still see gains. So I usually recommend three to four times a week, heavy full body movement exercises, lift heavy, get those legs, the back, the glutes, um, the pecs, the big body muscles activated and get that in routine, but then you have to supplement it with some type of rest, right? Uh, it could be walking. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of running, uh, like marathon running. If you want to run, maybe why not? Like <laughs> like, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Why not? Tell well, me more. Tell me more. Well, let's look at a sprinter, Hussein Bolt, and let's look at a marathon runner, right? Yeah. I mean, you just, just, it speaks massive for cortisol. Yeah, massive amounts of cortisol and stress and inflammation, right? Absolutely right. Yeah. So um, a, even weightlifting, more than 45 to 50 minutes, you'll start seeing cortisol levels creeping up. Sure. Um, and that happens with running as well. But but running is a it, it stimulates the the um, the uh, fast twitch fibers. So mm -hmm. um, what's happening is that there. No, I'm sorry. Am I mistaken there? No, you're right. Yeah. Um, running yet. Yeah. Yeah. So running would definitely is a, is a catabolic state, right? And you're not activating yeah. the muscles. Now, it's interesting that why does weightlifting increase testosterone levels? That's like my number one. It's like if you want to increase your T, you have to lift heavy three strength. to four times yeah. a week. Strength, strength, strength training, usually mm -hmm. five to eight reps. Some people like to go to 10, really whatever works for you. Why does that work? Well, weightlifting is an anaerobic process, right? And what happens in anaerobic respiration is that you have high levels of lactic acid. And that's why people think they have the burn. So they, you know, burn with like the, the pump. They think it's from the lactic acid. Actually, um, we're not really sure if that's the actual cause. It might be because of pH changes, not exactly the lactic acid. Right. But interestingly, and I've, and I've really dug into this deeply, is that uh, lactic acid stimulates the lytic cells of your testicles to make testosterone. Oh wow! That's that's the mechanism as to why weight training can increase testosterone levels. I mean, we know people from Arnold's decade, right? Where lift heavy, heavy weights on your back, and you're gonna increase your testosterone. They were not wrong. 
he was absolutely right. And everybody else who right. says that is right. Yes, lifting heavy weights will stimulate the body. Number one, just actually having heavy weight will stimulate growth hormone and stimulate testosterone production because the body's like, this is a stress that I need to respond to. Increases bone density, which is really important as well. But it's the lactic acid that stimulates, um, it's, it's, a, it's called a star receptor on the, um, on the um, mitochondria. And that actually stimulates production of uh, androgens in the mitochondria. Now, most people don't realize that testosterone and a lot of these hormones are made in the mitochondria of your cells. They just think, oh, it's made in my testicles. Well, if you look at it, look at it it's really when you go dig down molecularly, it's at the mitochondria that this is happening. So how many people have mitochondrial dysfunction where their mitochondria are not functioning well? They're on statin drugs. They can't. They don't have enough CoQ10. They're under tons of oxidative stress. And they, and they wonder why they only have energy. Well, you have to look down and dig deep to that level. So um, mitochondrial health is important. All these things. It all, seem, it all seems to come back to the mitochondria, man. Like, <laughs> uh, literally, like everything in life, right? Is they're, they're responsible for hormone production. They're responsible for energy production. And the little bacteria that nobody seems to pay all that much attention to or never used to anyways. Right. So during your uh, conversation there, you started mentioning uh, something really important, and that's libido. And yeah. I want to address that because it's a concern, man. A lot of guys are living that life, and they don't want to admit it. So, you know, I appreciate you, Dr. Esposito, and you need to be the one to help these guys out of – that misery uh, right. because i know a lot of guys in the fitness industry man like you you wear your badge of honor on, on your performance in the bedroom as it starts to diminish that'll crush your confidence faster yeah. than anything so i'd love for you to talk about that yeah so that's that's most of the time when uh, men used to come see me was yeah you know i i, I can't get it up you know I, I usually tell a lot of my uh my friends they're like well why do people come see you like men don't go to the doctor a man won't go a man won't go to the doctor if he has diabetes a man won't go to the doctor if he has high blood pressure. He won't go to the doctor if he has a headache or his ankle hurts. But if he can't get it up, trust me, he He's wants gone. to fix that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he wants to Extreme fix that. Extreme pain. Right? Yeah, that's a pain. It is. It's a, it's a mental yep. and psychological pain, and it, yep. and it can mess you up. I, I find that uh, libido is more of a mental game than it is a, a physical game, huh. right? And you, I find that a lot of men who have one instance of erectile dysfunction – now, erectile dysfunction is continuous, but let's say they drink a lot one night, they're out, um, they drank way too much, and they try to have sex with their girlfriend or their wife or somebody that they met, and they can't get it up. And it's because they just drank way too much because alcohol. And it's the anxiety in the back of their mind. Yeah. So that it happens yeah. one time, and now every time it happens, like, oh, man. Oh man, I uh, I had this happen last time, and uh, I'm gonna make sure I only have two beers, right? I'm not gonna have five <laughs> right. beers, and then and then and then it happens, and then like oh crap, I can't have any alcohol, and then the next time right. they go in, it's like, man, I, I didn't have any beers, and it still happens because they're thinking about it. So there's a mental aspect there. Um, there's a there's a testosterone aspect there as well, but the research is mixed on that. Men would assume take testosterone, my libido increases. Most of the time, yes, it does help, but not always. And I have seen that pretty frequently where men are on testosterone and they still have libido issues. And that is a hypercortisol type um, response is when their cortisol levels yep. are really high, it can suppress their immune system and basically turn off their libido. Um, but the, the major killer for libido is adrenaline. Epinephrine and adrenaline are the are basically the one thing that can completely kill a erection. And where do you get adrenaline from? That's from your adrenal glands. And when do you release it? From high stress environments. And when you're worried, right? I get tons of an adrenaline. I remember when I was in school taking a test, like my adrenaline was pumped. Like I didn't sleep much during med school. Not, not at all. But I- Most people don't. Yeah, but you walk into a test and you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. And, and you're focused and you're clear and your mind is straight. Well, men are very much like that when they enter a sexual interaction. It's like, all right, I'm going to enter this sexual interaction and she's going to like it and I'm going to be really successful and she's going to be, <laughs> she's going to orgasm and it's going to be awesome. I'm going to feel like a man, right? And it, they make it a task. And what happens when you make something a test? It's like a sport. It's like, I'm trying to get the goal. Well, don't look at the goal, enjoy the process. 
Uh, beautiful. Yeah. So that's really a that's really an important way of looking at it. But now let's talk about the physiological aspects. Uh, testosterone is definitely a major factor. Um, so that can have an impact. High cortisol levels, so high stress levels. Men who are not sleeping, men who are under extreme stress from work, uh, or just under stress overall, um, whether it's work or lifestyle, family, finances. Men who can't calm their mind. Now, this may sound a little out of the box, but meditation works. Dude, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. That, that's always my suggestion to guys who have low sex drive. I say stop watching porn yeah. and start meditating because porn's going to destroy it because you're not going to look at your spout, your partner the same right. way as you're looking at a girl on the screen and start meditating, man. I mean, that's it. You got to control your stress because yeah. like you said, cortisol and adrenaline are, are, are killing. I'm, I'm really happy you mentioned that porn stuff. I, I, now I have your permission to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So uh, the rates, I mean, when our parents or grandparents grew up, porn was really in magazines and maybe sure. randomly on like TV, right? right? Playboy magazines, that was it. And even that, that was like soft, yeah. right? That wasn't. Now yeah. you're finding stuff online. You can find porn all over on uh, on the internet. Really, you just I mean, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you can just Google it and it shows up. Um, so the issue, and I've seen that a lot of men who have they're addicted to porn, and what they're doing yep. is they when they watch porn, they get this arousal. Right? What's causing that arousal is a dopamine rush. Dopamine yep. is causing them to feel that emotion, and now they're watching porn and it's not realistic, right? It's definitely like you're looking at like a, a, a 10 out of 10 girl and this guy. And also you mentioned like they're looking at their partner differently than they see like the people in the porn. But also they see these men too. Like, you know, it's like they're, they're seeing these men like, wow, these guys are really fit and, and they can get any girl that they want. And, uh, you know, obviously their penis size is probably humongous. And it's like, oh, man, am I, am I able to do that? Right. And I, can I keep up with that? Right. And um, it's a mental game. So they keep on talking. They keep on. They, they messed with their mind. And then they get that when they're in the bedroom, they're thinking about their, um, their size. They're thinking about their partner. They're thinking about their appearance. And they're not able to get that dopamine rush from what they were getting from the I porn movie. I think there's also a desensitization aspect where like when you're first watching it, you know, you're in college or something and you're watching like really soft core, like <laughs> you know, really, really like the, this, the Friday night, late night stuff. And then you become desensitized and eventually you go down this slippery slope where you're watching stuff that's like just weird. And then it'll, you'll never be able to find that level of, of excitement and enthusiasm from a normal human being, right? Exactly. Like, so inevitably, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be let down. You're going to feel your wife's not fulfilling you. And all of a sudden, your marriage is out the window. Exactly right. You know, I make up yeah. a comparison to like food, right? Yeah. And they actually work on similar pathways is because of when people eat sugar and they eat chocolate and they eat high fatty foods, they're getting this, this sugar rush, but it's really a dopamine response. Dopamine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know... I, I admit I don't eat a lot of junk food and it, when I eat it, it makes me feel like crap. But people who eat Twinkies and candy bars and things like that, they crave it more because yep. a little bit doesn't do enough to their dopamine receptors. So they need a lot more of it. Now, I have found that cocoa powder, um, which is not very sweet, but it is bitter and the constituent in there called theobromin actually can activate dopamine receptors and uh, improve that, help you get off of the those sugar cravings. But it's also right. a therapy for men who tend to be watching a lot of porn. And just tell them like, look, have some cocoa because it can work on those dopamine receptors and be very uh, effective. That's great. Yeah. So I, I'm addicted to raw cocoa, but as funny as that sounds, like that's kind of my treat is, yeah, yeah I eat yeah. a lot of that stuff. So maybe I'm doing something right by accident. Um, so, Me too, actually. Oh, awesome. Um, so you mentioned yeah. some environmental and nutritional hacks for testosterone. And I think there's a lot of things people can be doing, but getting into just a few simple things that men should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe it's things to avoid nutritionally, or maybe it's things that they should add into their daily routine to really optimize testosterone. Yeah. So uh, disclaimer, for anybody who's vegetarian or vegan, do not hate me <laughs> from what I'm about to say, right. but I'm going to give you the just the data that I've seen. And actually a study came out, I read it maybe a week or two ago. And, if, and it said that a vegetarian, men who have a vegetarian or vegan based diet tend to have lower levels sure. of free and total testosterone. Now, I'm not saying that if you eat a vegetarian diet, 
your testosterone is going to go down, but the correlation was there. Do you, think, do you think that's an amino acid thing? Like they're not getting as much, you know, dopamine agonist, tyrosine, like things to support the production of dopamine and testosterone? I, I think it has a lot to do with leucine. Yeah. Um, because leucine is one of the, uh, and it's, it's a branch chain amino acid and sure. it actually activates mTOR. And I think sure. Dr. Lyon probably mm-hmm. spoke about this on her show. I remember she talking did. about it. Yep. mTOR stimulates protein synthesis, stimulates muscle growth. Yep. It's found in very low levels in plant-based foods. You're seeing a correlation between mTOR and testosterone. Yeah, because more muscle mass, right? would then require uh, more testosterone levels in order to maintain uh, that muscle mass. But more muscle mass can then increase testosterone levels because now you're able to actually, um, uh, you're stimulating more of a lactic acid production when you exercise, uh, that lactic acid then goes in and makes more testosterone. Now, do I have a study saying mTOR, in, activating mTOR increases testosterone levels? I haven't seen that. But I'm right. I'm looking at the biochemistry of it. I'm looking at the that makes sense. pathology of it and physiology of mm-hmm. it. So it, it makes sense to me. So I think it has a lot to do with leucine. I do think that a vegetarian diet can be can have a lot of phytoestrogens, um, and that includes a lot of soy, uh, pomegranates, flax seeds. Now I'm not. I, I actually think phytoestrogens can be protective. So I'm not saying that these phytoestrogens lower your testosterone levels. I do think at high doses. And getting too much of it can be problematic. Soy protein, soy milk, um, uh, uh, anything. I mean, everything could be soy based right now, like soy yogurt, uh, tofu. I mean, it's it's almost in everything. So that's a that's a concern for me as well. But I do think it has to do with the protein. And having protein uh, stimulates growth hormone. We know that having higher levels of protein can increase IGF, which then can enhance muscle growth as well. So I, I definitely think that has a factor there. Sh- but more so, I think sugar is the biggest problem. And the reason why I think so is because when you have sh- high, sh- high sugar uh, intake, you're stimulating insulin. Now, there's many people who say, well, weight loss is a result of uh, calories. And there's many people say, you know, if it fits your macros. And then there's many people who say, well, no, it's, it's a metabolic thing. It's about estrogen. Um, it's about insulin and and ghrelin and leptin and glucagon. And um, I agree with both groups. Uh, I have uh, many patients who their macros are on point, but they still can't lose a lot of weight. So right. uh, that is definitely a concern. You know, when I look at it, I'm like, okay, well, what's going on here? And insulin uh, actually can directly activate aromatase. So when you have high sugar levels, high insulin levels, you're then increasing uh, aromatase, which then converts testosterone to estrogen. And I mean, it just comes as simple as that. It's like, just cut back on the simple carbohydrates. If you're gonna have carbs, make sure they're complex. You know, sweet potatoes, quinoa is great. Um, All vegetables, really, they're all pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. Big consideration, I think, in, you know, people misunderstanding the if it fits your macros reality is the gut health, right? Like right. gut health is, there's such a divergence from your gut to my gut that how you deal with food will be completely different than mine. So it just makes no sense to attach to just one school of thought. Like I just have to hit my macros without acknowledging the biochemistry reality of right. what's actually happening when you ingest that food is completely different. Absolutely right. And and now that you mentioned that, the impact of soy, we used to think that soy and uh, foods that had a lot of phytoestrogens um, uh, genistein and diatazine, which is their, uh, the phytoestrogenic or isoflavones in soy, we thought that those were the reasons why you know soy had a phytoestrogen, um, a estrogen-like effect. But in fact, it's what the microbiome does to it. And there's certain bacteria that metabolizes it into something called equal, E-Q-U-O-L. And we find that that actually ha- is the microbiome, the bacteria will take the diatazine and the genistein, these soy derivatives, and metabolize it into equal. And that's what you absorb, and that's what has an impact on the estrogen receptors. But we found that it actually has a less effect, so it has a, a less of a strong uh, effect on the estrogen receptor compared to estrogen. So in somebody who has high estrogen levels, I think maybe having a little bit of soy as like tofu or tempeh, naturally occurring flax seeds, pomegranate, 
um, not processed, but in its original form, edamame, that might not be too bad, just you don't want to overdo it. So that's where a lot of these environmental and that's, um, and, and that's where we come to like the diet aspect. So beautiful. So segueing from the estrogen conversation into you, one thing you brought up along the way was um, xenoestrogens and the idea of potentially, um, you know, influencing these things with GI health or detoxing. Um, is that something that you recommend to people? And if so, in what method? Yeah, absolutely. And the number one method, the best method is to make sure that you go to the bathroom once a day, minimum once a day. You have to have a bowel movement yeah. once a day. I speak to patients all the time and I say any constipation like, no, I'm like, well, how often do you have a bowel movement? Oh, every other day, every three days. And I'm like, but if you're eating three times a day, right, don't you think that you should eliminate, I mean, if not three times a day, which is pretty, I mean, not many people do, but at least once a day, you should have a bowel movement. Right. And the reason right. why is because um, when we get rid of these uh, estrogen and testosterone metabolites, they're, they go through something called glucuronidation, right, through the liver and the kidneys, and that's where they're released. Now, there's bacteria in the gut that can actually reverse that. They call, we call it beta-glucuronidase. Beta and yep. when the, so you have an estrogen compound and it's bound and it's glucuronidated. So it's bound to a glucuronide compound or it's a molecule. And that prevents it from being reabsorbed and you eliminate it and get rid of it. Now, if you have these bacteria, which are not beneficial, they break that bond and allow that estrogen and even testosterone and other metabolites toxins to be reabsorbed. The same thing happens with a lot of these xenoestrogens or xenobiotics is that we're unable to eliminate them via our liver, our kidneys, our intestinal tract, our skin, um, even our lungs. I mean, anything that comes in and out of the body is a way for us to get rid of something. Beautiful. I yeah. mean, people don't look at like smoking. I mean, that's a prime example. Once you take in that cigarette smoke, you increase activity of this enzyme called alpha-1 antitrypsin, and you are slowly breaking down your lungs, right? But we can get rid of toxins that way as well. Um, we can get rid of toxins in our gut, in our skin. So these xenobiotics, we have a tough time detoxing them because we're so uh, 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 overwhelmed with all these other things in our environment that can be impacting our ability to detox and and I don't really like that word detox because people think I'm 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 sure. pushing like a cleanse like no I don't think right. I need to do like this super cleanse every month or every week that's not what I'm saying right. I'm talking about phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 detoxification basic biophysiology that you learn in med school or even in graduate school on how the body detoxes Phase one, the cytochrome, right. phase two, which is glucuronidation and glutathione and SOD. That's what I'm talking about. If you can get rid of those things naturally, then um, it puts a less of a burden on the body. Just supporting those processes. I did a really great episode with Dr. Brian Walsh recently where he literally walked through all the, the phases of detoxification. Uh, he actually has been talking about a phase zero, which he explains all in the episode as well, which is super interesting. So, man, I really appreciate you, Dr. Esposito. I want to finish with one question about three lifestyle um, you know, to use the, the common catchphrase hacks that you can recommend for people that you implement yourself to optimize testosterone and avoid or eliminate xenoestrogens. So number one, sleep over everything. So don't think that you're going to wake up on five hours of sleep and think that that 5 a.m. workout is going to be more beneficial than getting an extra two hours of sleep. So, so that's that's my question, right? Is like if it's if it's I get to work out, meditate or sleep, what do you choose? Sleep. Good. Sleep one. All the, every time? Every time? Or do you alternate? <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm going to say sleep over everything. Sleep okay. sleep over exercise. Um, meditation is definitely helpful, but unless you're meditating for an hour, um, you know, most people have a difficult time meditating for an hour. So, yeah. uh, but definitely include meditation. I do it every morning. So uh, sleep, number one. Uh, meditation if you don't like that word meditation call it mindfulness if you don't like that word mindfulness and prayer 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 is great right whatever whatever you're testing I mean, as yeah. simple as breathing just just doing five mm. seconds breathing in hold five seconds breathing out that's that's mm. as simple as, i mean you do that four or five times you'll lower your stress levels what what benefits do you see personally yeah. i have a ton of things on my agenda on my to-do list I wake up and I'm like, okay, what do I have to do today? 
you know, during, during sure. med school, I had severe anxiety and I actually grew up with IBS uh, growing up. So it was definitely anxiety driven. And it was just because I had a million things to do. And as I got into, after school, I got into the work field. I'm like, I, I thought this would go away, right? I thought it was just school, but no, it's just stress. So um, waking up and meditating uh, for like 10 minutes really makes a big difference. Um, I do guided meditation, uh, Vipassana meditation, um, starting to get into transcendental. So uh, meditation is definitely a big uh, factor and it just completely slows down uh, my day and I'm able to deal with stresses a lot better. Like, you know, uh, somebody, you know, gives me an email. It's like, you know, I need this done in two hours. I would typically freak out, but after a meditation session, it's, it's, it's much easier. It's much easier to handle. Stress is perception of, of stress coupled with a feeling of helplessness. That's what stress is. Stress is not, you know, uh, somebody punching you in the head. It's the perception of somebody punching you in the head and then you feeling like you can't do anything right. about it. That's stress. Right. So if we can change the perception of the stress and we have some control over it via meditation or exercise, then we re- remove the perception and we handle the helplessness and it reduces the amount of stress. Beautiful, man. That brings up a book, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Me. And the only thing we have in life is our ability to choose our, our reaction to something, right? Exactly uh, right. That's beautiful. Exactly right. And so, so yeah, sleep, one final thing. meditation. Yep. And the one final thing in terms of improving testosterone levels, uh, man. Or even eliminating xenoestrogens. Is there something you do in your lifestyle that allows you to avoid those things that you know to be estrogenic? Yeah. So, I mean... I, I, I kind of say this as a matter of fact, I haven't eaten out of plastic for a while. Mm-hmm. I would try to have people minimize the amount of times that they use a microwave and plastic. Um, getting a good quality uh, a water filter because there are xenobiotics, there's a antibiotics. Which one do you use? Uh, the Berkley or okay. Berkey. Berkey, yep. Yeah, yeah, that one works really well. Yep. Um, a lot of people just buy water. There's a few companies that make really good quality water. I like Penta. Yep. Uh, they they filter via reverse osmosis. Except it's in plastic, so right. Yeah, so you can't. It's always a catch twenty two. Exactly. What what do you do there? So um, to yep. to avoid the xenobiotics or the xenoestrogens, I I take silymarin every day, uh, milk thistle. That's something that I do every single day. I'll take that, and then um, do, does that help with bind with estrogens? It can help with detoxifying estrogens. Um, if you really okay. want to target that, I would look at DIM diendolyl methane. Yep. That's probably a better yep. way of looking at it, but um, because I'm not on testosterone replacement and my, I actually do, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Dutch test, the Dutch urinary test. Yeah. I, I use that a lot yeah. on, uh, I actually do it on myself and other patients and I looked at, I look at estrogen metabolites. Um, one of the, really one of the best ways to look at it and myself, I'm fine with that, but other people, I would put them on DIM to help get rid of that. But silymarin, which is a phase two detox supporter, um, a lot of great help for liver support. So that's that's that would be, probably be my staple to help with detoxifying because it's not something that you do like I'm doing a week, two week detox. It's it's detox is, every is, day. is an everyday thing, everyday thing. I've heard I've seen some research or I've heard about research. I've never seen it myself about silymarin decreasing testosterone. Any oh, um, I would have to look at that. I don't know. I have to see how they would measure. Take, take a peek. I don't know if it's true. Oh man, I might be killing mm-hmm. myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're knocking it down, man. I appreciate you so much. That was absolutely incredible. Uh, where can people find out more about you and what you teach? Yeah, so you can find me uh, on my website. It's drralphesposito.com. Uh, Instagram, I post a ton of things on there uh, on Instagram, my Facebook and Twitter. So those are really the three best places to find me. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I, I usually respond pretty quickly. I just like, I like to spread knowledge and I like to have people be educated because there's so much bro science. There's so much false information out there. Um, and I just want people to be educated and to, to, uh, to do the right thing. And you do an incredible job, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And so do all my listeners. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, man. Have a great day. And that's a wrap boys and girls. Dr. Ralph Esposito, the male doc hormone deep dive. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And I know you're going to want to share it with somebody who's living a life of low testosterone, just to give you guys a bit of a recap on today's episode. So we discussed how to deal with low testosterone and how testosterone may not be the guilty culprit that you think it is as far as decreasing your sex drive. There's a lot of environmental triggers 
that you're probably dealing with that are affecting your low testosterone and potentially your low libido. Dr. Esposito gave us some pretty great insights on what you may want to be using to hack your low testosterone. And as you guys heard, the first and most important one was sleep. Um, then we're going to start addressing our nutrition and start addressing our stress. And those things are so simple that you can do every single day to really make the most of not only your testosterone, but your life in general. If you're not living a life of vigor and health, why not, right? It's Living a long life is no fun unless you're living a great life. Uh, Dr. Esposito also told us something interesting about androgen receptors. And it's something that I've thought about all the time. As a pro bodybuilder, I've been exposed to a lot of really interesting people uh, acknowledging that more testosterone is not better. Better is better. And that's kind of the, the, the theme of my life, right, is, is I'm not trying to do more training. I'm not trying to read more books. I'm not trying to read more or do, learn more. I'm trying to get really good at some very specific things. So learning how to make the most of the testosterone that you do have is step one before adding more testosterone. On top of that, um, he gets into some really interesting things about just looking at the whole picture of testosterone and optimizing your life. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. And if you did, share. Um, I guarantee there's one person out there who would absolutely love this information. I'm going to share it with my dad right now. And you may want to do the same. Leave us a review as always. I'm so grateful to Dr. Esposito. Uh, so if you love him, check him out on Instagram. That's where I found him. Uh, and his great friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, is uh, an amazing influencer for our female demographic for hormones and also for our males with respect to muscle building. So check out the episode I did with her and have an awesome day. Live your greatness.